Hello, and welcome to today's lecture on The Classical Legacy. I'm your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we are going to look at the impact that ancient Greece and ancient Rome have had on the contemporary world. So, we'll go ahead and start by asking the question, why study history? Right? We'll just touch on a couple points there, and then we'll look at the legacy of Greece, followed by the legacy of Rome, and wrap up with a few concluding thoughts. So, why study history, right? Maybe you're asking that question right now after you've been through most of the course, but let's go ahead. Uh, one of the, the issues, right, is that Augustus is not going to teach you how to computer program, all right? And it might be, actually, that learning ancient Greek and Latin uh, gives you a sense for how different languages fit together, so maybe that is useful for programming. But Augustus himself is not going to come up and start programming JavaScript for you. So why do it at all if it's not going to kind of lead directly into your programming job? Well, right, the kind of traditional uh, explanation is essentially that those who do not study the past are doomed to repeat it. And people have been saying that in one form or another for two millennia, all right? The quote itself actually comes from like the 1800s, and that was based on a quote from the 1700s. And that goes all the way back to Livy, actually, right? The guy who wrote The Foundation of Rome 2,000 years ago, and he basically said the reason that he's writing this is because we've got all these examples in history of different situations and, and actions that were made based on those situations, and then the outcomes for how those actions turned out. And we can use those to kind of decide what to do in the modern day. So that's one of the main reasons. But one of the other reasons is that classical anti antiquity um, very much shapes the way the world is today, especially here in America. All right? So much of what we have in kind of the most prominent realms of our lives in terms of politics and economics and education uh, and, and uh, theater and pop culture and everything, sports, right, can go back to ancient Greece and Rome. So let's go ahead and start with Greece and look at some of the ways uh, that it has left a legacy for us today. Now, the number one thing has got to be democracy, right? We say that we live in a democracy today, and it's ancient Greece in this kind of time of chaos, right? In between being threatened by Sparta and then Persia coming in a few years later, uh, they very quickly develop this idea um, of kind of direct democracy, where people are chosen by lot to serve on a committee, that sets the agenda of what to vote on, and then every male citizen can go into a room and they raise their hand or they drop their colored stone into a certain basket, and they are directly voting on the issues of the day. Should we raise taxes? Should we put somebody to death? Should we go to war with Sparta? These people are making those decisions. So democracy today is quite a bit different. It's actually more like Roman republicanism. We'll talk about that in a second. But this idea of giving power to the people is one of the most kind of influential aspects of ancient Greece. We also have philosophy, right? So we still ask these kind of core questions today. How does the world work? Why does it work the way it does? And then how should we behave in the world, right? And some of these things end up being the core kind of questions that we ask in science, right? How does the world work? And we have people investigating those in a very kind of um, uh, scientific way, for lack of a better term now. Uh, but we also have philosophers, right, talking about the way that we should act in the world. Theater and drama, right? Now, the, the form here has changed. We still have theater that you can go and watch live people. But for the most part, you're going to the movies, you're at home watching Netflix, that sort of thing. But this idea of, of kind of tragedy and dramas, right, or comedies, end up going back to ancient Greece. And one of the cool things here is this was actually a core part of society, and it gave people a way to voice their opinions on kind of the way things were going culturally at the time. And this especially happened in the Greek world in comedies, right? So comedies were used to be able to express people's concerns of the day. And so, for example, uh, during the Peloponnesian War, as Athens and Sparta were fighting, we get Aristophanes writing plays like the Lysistrata, where the women of Athens go on a sex strike from the men until they bring an end to the war. And it's very much the people saying, hey, why are we embroiled in this war? It's not good for anybody. Now, architecture, right? You're looking at the, uh, the Hephaestion from the Athenian Agora over here, and then you're looking at the United States Treasury uh, in Washington, D.C. over here, and man, she always look awfully similar, right? So neoclassical architecture gets all of its core components from the ancient Greek and Roman worlds. Uh, you can do kind of an architectural analysis, figure out the differences here. See if you can do it. 
OK, well, one of them, right? Uh, we've got the Doric order over here with these kind of bowl-shaped cap capitals, where we've got the Ionic order over here um, with the column bases and with the scroll volute capitals on top. Sports, right? Sports, this idea of like kind of friendly competition, athletic competition, goes back to ancient Greece. We've got statues like the Discobolus. We've got the Olympics, founded in 776 BC. And those lasted for over a thousand years in antiquity before being brought to an end by the Emperor Theodosius right before 400 CE. But in 1896, a guy by the, na by the name of uh, Pierre uh, de Coubertin ends up bringing this back, right? This idea of the Olympics back. And from 1896 until today, uh, we have these every four years or more recently, um, every two years. And that's a tradition, again, that goes back over 2,700 years halfway across the world. Science and technology, right? If you, if you made it to college and you're watching this right now, it's probably because you took the SAT. And if you took the SAT, I know you busted out the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, and that goes back to our main man here, Pythagoras, right? So things like that, mathematics, the calendar, astronomy, um, all have monumental developments in the ancient Greek world. Medicine and healthcare, right? Uh, if you're going into medicine, one day you will take the Hippocratic Oath, right? First, do no harm. And that's named after our guy over here, Hippocrates of Kos. Now, he had his own kind of versions of sayings, and they didn't exactly match up to what we call the Hippocratic Oath today. Um, but he did kind of actually practice that idea of first, do no harm. Actually, a lot of what he did was just tell people to, like, stop eating for a while and go drink a lot of water and maybe have some vinegar. So basically, kind of go on a cleanse, and hopefully that'll help you. Um, but this idea of studying medicine systematically goes all the way back to Greece with guys like Hippocrates and a couple hundred years after that, a guy by the name of Galen. Art, right? The fine arts, um, especially Renaissance art, is completely based on ancient Greece and Rome. And so you can see these ancient Greek and Roman statues over here of Venus or Aphrodite, right? This is a very particular version known as the Venus Pudica, right, where she's covering herself. And we can see that exact same style used over here in Botticelli's um, uh, Birth of Venus, right? And so we can see her arising on the half shell there, covering herself just like these statues that came 1,500 years earlier. And this idea, kind of uh, along with art, right, this idea of kind of um, realism and idealism very much embodied in Greece. Uh, literature, right, in order to understand a lot of literature from kind of the Renaissance on, you have to understand ancient Greek and Roman literature, right? And even today in the modern world, when we're looking at things like movies, we get movies like, if you've ever seen Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? This is set in a different place in a different time, but it exactly models the story of Homer's Odyssey. And so to really appreciate much of literature in the modern world, you got to understand what's going on with literature in ancient Greece. And then, saving the best for last, right? Of course, we've got delicious wine. Right? And so winemaking, um, maybe Greece isn't actually the earliest culture uh, to drink wine. And if you want to know more about that, uh, take my uh, Humanities 150b1 class, Mind-Altering Substances in the Ancient World, where we'll talk a lot about the origins of wine uh, from not just Greece and Rome, but from all over the ancient world. Um, but Greece is a, it kind of plays a huge role in the Greek diet, and it became a part of everyday life. Um, and today, it still is for many people. So let's move westward now across the Mediterranean to Rome, the legacy of Rome. So just like we started with democracy for the Greeks, now we move on to Roman republicanism, right? Again, perhaps nothing is more important than the, the idea that people should share kind of power in the way that they're governed. And with the Greek world, we saw this idea of direct democracy. Everybody goes in and votes on an issue. Over here in Rome, we have this idea of republicanism, where we vote on officials to take office, and then the officials do the legislating. And that's the core idea of Roman republicanism. And it's actually much, much closer to what we have. And even though we call it a democracy today in America, it's much, much closer to Roman republicanism. Now, Romans were able to build this enormous empire, and a huge part of the reason they were able to do that is because of their developments in engineering and construction. Now, so many buildings today, right? I passed some on the way in. Uh, and to record this lecture, are being made out of concrete right now. And that development goes back to ancient Rome. And when you see buildings like this, this is the roof, the, the kind of dome of the Pantheon in Rome, 
that dates back 2,000 years. It was the largest dome in the world for 1,500 years. And the reason it can stand up is because it's made of concrete. The reason Rome is able to put ports and harbors all around the Mediterranean is they developed a type of concrete that will actually set underwater. And so the use of these kind of everyday things like concrete and vaults and arches and domes all goes back to ancient Rome. Christianity, right? I was looking it up, something like there are 1.6 billion Christians in the world today, and that all goes back to Roman antiquity, right? So Jesus is born under the Emperor Augustus, the very first emperor. He dies under the Emperor Tiberius, uh, the second emperor. And then uh, his followers, right, over the next few hundred years start to grow the religion. And today, like something like uh, a little less than a third of the world ends up being Christian. And you can think about why that was an attractive religion back in Roman antiquity. Uh, in Rome, right, uh, they don't have a super developed idea of the afterlife in traditional kind of Roman pagan religion. And so the, the idea that kind of, um, you know, you live life to the best in the life that you've got is very appealing if you're a rich Roman, right? Go ahead with your convivium, drink your wine and, and hang out and have fun with your aristocratic friends. But if you're at the kind of lower end of the spectrum, it's far less appealing. And so something like Christianity that says, hey, don't worry about how crappy your life is right now, right? Worry about something beyond, right? After you die, that's where you'll be rewarded. That ends up being very, very kind of appealing to a kind of marginalized segment of the population. And 2,000 years later, it's a third of the world's population. The Latin language, right? So if you are writing anything down, if you're taking notes right now, you are most likely doing so, not using the Greek alphabet, but using the Latin script. And so we still use the Latin script today. And again, the idea of a script is that you can write any language in it, right? So you could write Spanish or English or German or Latin, all in the Latin script, right? Using Latin letters. You can write a diversity of languages. But Latin itself ends up contributing to English in a particular sort of way, right? Something like 60% of the words that we've got in English go back to Latin roots. So not only do we use the script, most of our words today have Latin roots as well. The idea of codified law, right? Now this sounds really boring, right? Okay, so they wrote some laws down. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is once you write laws down, everybody has to play by the same rules. You can't have your aristocratic friends saying, oh yeah, well, don't worry about that, right? Uh, because the laws are now written in stone or bronze or on a computer, whatever it may be, right? Um, the, uh, the idea that laws are codified means everybody plays by the same rules, and this is really important uh, for kind of the development of equality within a society. Architecture, right? So what we're looking at here, we are looking at the, uh, the Pantheon in Rome on the left-hand side, right? Dating back originally to Marcus Agrippa, that's whose name's up there, but then rebuilt by Hadrian in the second century AD. It's this super weird kind of temple where it's like rectilinear on the front and then cylindrical on the back and for 1,500 years has the largest dome in the world. And we're not looking at a model of the Pantheon over here on the right. What we're looking at is, take a guess. That's right, it's the Jefferson Memorial, right? So in Washington, D.C., the Jefferson Memorial is directly modeled on the Pantheon. And so just like we saw with the U.S. Treasury and uh, um, something like the Hephaestion in the Athenian Agora, we see all the same kind of elements. Capitals and a dome, this kind of... Um, uh, podium over here, the idea that you have the rectilinear front and the cylindrical back, a lot of influence from ancient Roman architecture shows up today, especially in neoclassical architecture. Infrastructure, right? You've heard all roads lead to Rome, right? And so Romans were known for building these elaborate road networks. And one of the coolest things is you can still go walk on them today, right? You can see here the old cart marks, right? That would have been driven by donkeys or horses or whatever. You can see they've worn their way into this ancient Roman road. And you too can go outside the walls of Rome and go walking down the Via Appia. And this idea, right? Roads are a huge part of the way that we get around. And along with sewage systems and aqueducts, and ports and harbors, right? This idea of a fundamentally strong infrastructure is very much a part of the ancient Roman world. Sport and spectacle, right? We looked at sport with the ancient Greek world and we looked at things like the Olympics. And we often associate sport with ancient Greece 
because it's more about the athletic competition itself. We often associate spectacle with ancient Rome because it's about the crowds, right? In a way that is kind of uh, above and beyond what was going on uh, in the Greek world, you get crowds involved with Rome at the gladiatorial games and in the circuses. So the Colosseum held something like 50,000 people, right? It's about the size of a college football stadium today. And they were all there to cheer on their favorite gladiator or their favorite chariot racing team. Uh, and so it came, became something more than just kind of participating in a sport for the athletic kind of competition and the, the kind of health benefits. It became a place to go be social, to be, uh, to be seen and to see people and to meet people um, and to interact with one another. The military, right? The idea of a professional military goes back to Rome, all right? And so we got a military today where you can sign up for it, and that's your job, right? Uh, you get paid to do it, um, you get benefits afterwards, right? Whether that's education or retirement benefits, something like that. This idea goes back to Rome, and it wasn't always like that. In the early days of Rome, right, the idea was that only citizens from the city could be, in, uh, uh, citizens of Rome could be part of the military, and you had to have land and be able to equip yourself with the weapons and armor necessary. But later under Marius, we see him professionalize the army, say that the, the government will pay for your, your armor and weapons, that you don't have to have land, uh, that you'll get an annual salary, and that if you serve a certain amount of time, you're going to get some land uh, when you retire. All right? And so that idea of this the army is a full-time job rather than a citizen militia that rises up when called upon is something that goes back uh, to the Roman civilization. And then finally, once again, the most important thing, wine, right? And if the Greeks liked their wine, the Romans liked it even more. And so in the Roman world, you've got all these different varietals, right? So you've got your regular wine, you've got this Egyptian wine, they mix it with honey and other weird kind of things. Uh, Falernian wine, that was like the highest level of wine. It was very expensive in the ancient Roman world. That's what the emperors drank. And it became kind of so popular that people in the Roman world are drinking something like a liter of wine per person per day. So you should probably not do that. That's a little, uh, a little bit overkill. Um, but Rome definitely influenced us in uh, making this a, a very kind of popular beverage. So a few concluding thoughts. There are a lot of different reasons to study classical antiquity, right? Uh, and one of the main ones is if you don't study it, you're going to be doomed to, re to, to repeat the mistakes of the past. But one of the big reasons, right, is that ancient Greece and ancient Rome have a huge influence, right? You can look at the Senate floor in ancient Rome. You can look at the Senate floor uh, in uh, modern America. One of the huge reasons is that uh, both Greece and Rome have played uh, an incredible role in kind of developing American society uh, throughout our history, but especially in the, uh, the 21st century. And that's what we might call the classical legacy.